We're about to review every single topic of AP Physics E and M. This is the only video you're going to need to study for your exam. We'll cover electric fields, electric potential, conductors and capacitors, circuits, magnetic fields, and induction. Charged particles exert electric force on each other like how objects with mass exert gravitational force on each other. This force can be found using Coulomb's law, which says force is proportional to the product of the charges over the distance squared. The proportionality constant is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Charges with the same sign repel while opposite charges attract. There are a couple different units of charge. An elementary charge is just the charge of one proton or electron, while a coulomb is the charge of 6.25 times 10 to the 18th elementary charges. At a microscopic level, electrons are the charges doing the moving, not protons. Electrons have a couple ways of doing this. Conduction is when electrons transfer because objects touch each other, and induction is when electrons temporarily transfer because objects with different charges get close to each other. Electric field lines show the direction a positive charge would feel a force. There are a couple rules for E fields. They point from positive to negative charges, never cross, and more concentrated E field lines means a stronger E field. We can find a numeric value for the E field strength at a point by dividing the electric force a particle would feel by the particle's charge. Finding the E field due to a point charge is easy. We just find KQ over R squared, or if there are multiple point charges, we add all of the KQ over R squareds. If we're not dealing with point charges though, we have to integrate. In order to do this, we find DQ dr, the charge density, to replace the differential DQ with dr times a function of R. Now everything inside our integral is in terms of r, so we evaluate our definite integral with appropriate bounds. Pause the video and read through the example problem if you want some extra practice. There's an easier way to find E field though, using Gauss's law. But first we have to talk about flux. Electric flux is a measure of how many E field lines go through a given surface. We can calculate it by integrating E dot dA, where A is the area of our Gaussian surface. Note that positive flux is defined by lines exiting the surface. Now for Gauss's law. Gauss's law tells us that the electric flux through a surface equals the charge enclosed by that surface over epsilon naught. Next, electric potential tells us how badly a positive charge wants to avoid a certain location. Electric potential energy, a new form of energy, is proportional to the electric potential a given charge feels. Since work equals negative change in potential energy, potential difference equals negative work over the charge. Since work is also the integral of force dot displacement, we can find V in terms of E field. This formula is pretty helpful because it allows us to derive formulas for V. Near a point charge, V equals KQ over R. And just like when we were calculating E field strength, if we have more than a single point charge, we use a sum or an integral. We can describe the electric potential of a system using equipotential lines. These lines are drawn so that every point on the line has the same electric potential. E field lines are always perpendicular to equipotential lines because charges are always trying to move toward lower electric potential. We've talked about how to find electric potential using E field, but it's also useful to find the E field using electric potential. E field is simply the negative derivative of electric potential with respect to displacement. If E field is constant, you don't have to use a derivative, you can just divide change in V by change in R. A conductor is a special object where all the charge resides on the surface and is free to move around. Think about enclosing the inside of a conductor with a Gaussian surface. Gauss's law tells us that since there's no charge inside the conductor, there can't be an E field inside the conductor either. Finally, because charges are free to move, every point on the conductor has the same potential. If there is a point with lower potential, the charges would instantly move to that point, balancing it out. Capacitors are systems that include two differently charged sheets of material spaced out from each other. One sheet is positive and the other is negative. In an ideal capacitor, the charge that resides on each surface is equal in magnitude to the capacitance times the potential difference. For a parallel plate capacitor like the one shown to the right, 
capacitance is proportional to the sheet area divided by how spaced out they are. The material between the sheets matters too, though. If a capacitor is filled with a dielectric, a constant is added to the equation. Capacitors can be combined in series and in parallel, as shown to the right. When attached in parallel, the total capacitance is just the sum of the individual capacitances. When combined in series, the inverse of total capacitance is the sum of all the inverses of the capacitances. The equations relating capacitors in series and parallel are the same, same as the ones relating spring constants, if that helps you remember them. Up until now, we've just talked about parallel plate capacitors, but there are also other types. Spherical capacitors are nested spheres with capacitance proportional to the product of the radii over the difference between the radii. Cylindrical capacitors are nested cylinders and their capacitance is a bit more complicated. These equations are not on your reference table, so be sure to put them in your calculator to reference them during the exam. Charging the plates of capacitors requires work done, meaning that charged capacitors store potential energy. This energy can be calculated by 1 half QV, or we can use Q equals CV to get other equivalent formulas. Now we're going to look at electric circuits. Let's start off with some basic definitions. Current is the rate charge flows, or the derivative of charge with respect to time. Kirchhoff's junction rule says that the current in equals the current out, or current is conserved. Resistance is a measure of how hard it is for current to pass through an object. Resistance is proportional to length over cross-sectional area. Voltage, or potential difference, which we've talked about, is what causes current. The charges want to move to lower potential on the other end of the battery. Ohm's law says that voltage equals resistance times current, and Kirchhoff's loop rule says that the sum of the voltage is zero when completing a loop. Just like springs and capacitors, resistors can be placed in parallel and series. Resistors in series create a total resistance equal to the sum of the individual resistances, and resistors in parallel follow the same inverse rule we saw for capacitors and springs in series. Power represents the rate work is done and is visually represented by the brightness of something like a light bulb. It equals IV, I squared R, and V squared over R which are all equal according to Ohm's law. We've talked about how charging a capacitor stores energy, but we want to quantify the charge and current through a capacitor while it charges. We can use Kirchhoff's loop rule to write a differential equation for charge, and then solve it by separating the differentials and integrating. The charge on the plates increases at a decreasing rate until leveling off, while current exponentially decays to zero. We can also discharge a capacitor in the circuit with no battery. Again, we start with the loop equation and solve by separating and integrating. We find that when discharging, charge on the plates decays exponentially along with current. Also, note that the time constant for a RC circuit, tau RC, represents the time it takes for 37% of the charge to be left on the plates. With electricity, we learned that static electric charges create electric fields found by using Coulomb's law. Now with magnetism, moving charges create magnetic fields with a different equation for force. Magnetic force is the cross product of charge times velocity and magnetic or B field. Taking a vector cross product isn't testable in the AP, but you can use the equation QVB sine theta to find the magnitude of magnetic force. Because of how a cross product is defined, magnetic force is always perpendicular to both velocity and B-field, as we can see in our top picture. This equation is what defines the B-field. In the bottom picture, we see an example of B-field for a bar magnet. Magnetic north is defined as where B-field lines emerge, and south is where B-field lines enter. Every magnet has a north and a south. Magnetic monopoles do not exist. We used QVB sine theta to calculate magnetic force, but which direction does it point? We use our first right-hand rule, pointing your thumb towards current and fingers toward B field. That way your palm points in the direction of magnetic force. If you're a lefty, you're out of luck because this only works if you use your right hand. So far, B field has just been this mysterious thing we need in order to calculate the force, 
but now let's talk about what it actually is. B fields form loops around wires. The direction of the loop is found using right hand rule number two. Point your thumb toward current and your fingers curl counterclockwise or clockwise showing you the direction of the B field loop. In electricity we saw that E fields did work on charges changing their electric potential energy. B fields are different. They never do work because cross product used to calculate force makes force always perpendicular to B field and velocity. We know B fields form loops around wires, but how do you actually calculate them? One way is to use the Biot-Savart law, which shows that B field is a function of current, length, distance from wire, and angle between current and distance from wire. There's one special case we have to use Biot-Savart's law when dealing with a ring of current. To the right, we see how integrating the equation and substituting 2 pi r for dl gives us an expression for B field at the center of a ring of current. You don't have to use Biot-Savart's law very often though because we have a second, much easier law, Ampere's law. Ampere's law is similar to Gauss's law in that you have to draw a shape, in this case an Amperian loop that encloses 2D current. The integral of B field along the loop equals mu naught times current. You want to draw your path so that the B field is the same everywhere on the loop. That way you can pull B out of the integral as shown in the example derivation. Then you can use ratios to find the enclosed current. We see that B field in a wire is proportional to radius. Switching topics, we know how to calculate magnetic force, but what about the special case where we have a current carrying wire in a B field? Instead of QVB sine theta, we can use BIL sine theta for constant current, which I remember as BIL. The angle theta is specifically the angle between B field and the wire. I won't go too in depth right now, but an example application of this formula is when you have two parallel wires. Using FM equals BIL, you can find that the parallel wires feel a force towards each other, and wires with current going in opposite directions repel. Our last topic for this unit is solenoids. We have another right hand rule for solenoids. Curl your fingers in the direction of current and your thumb points toward the north end of the solenoid, or towards the B field inside the solenoid. Be careful because the B field outside the solenoid is different. B field lines outside the solenoid point from north to south. How do you actually calculate B field inside a solenoid? Remember this equation B equals money, with N equaling loops per meter. Our first topic in this unit is magnetic flux. Like electric flux, magnetic flux is the integral of B field dot dA. Let's look at flux in a few different situations. Flux through a closed surface is always zero because magnetic field lines never form monopoles. In other words, whenever a line points from north to south, there is one cancelling it out that points from south to north. Flux in a constant B field equals B A cos theta, and flux through a wire is shown to the right. But the reason we care about flux is that it induces current. We use the right hand rule number 4 to determine the direction of current induced by flux. Find change in flux, and then point your thumb the opposite direction. The direction is your fingers curl, show the direction of current. But if there's current in a wire, there must also be an EMF. EMF is the negative derivative of magnetic flux. This checks out because an EMF is only induced when flux changes. If flux is constant, there's no EMF and therefore no current. If we have multiple loops, like a solenoid, multiply negative deflux dt by the number of loops to get EMF. Another way to get EMF is using Faraday's law which states that EMF equals the integral of E dot DL. Now let's switch topics and talk about inductance. When current carrying loops induce flux, flux is proportional to current with L, the inductance, being the proportionality constant. And if we have a solenoid with N loops, we just multiply by N to get L. We can also get inductance by simply using the physical properties of the solenoid. The higher the number of turns and higher the area, the higher the inductance. We can put inductors in circuits to produce B fields. When current increases, flux changes, and an EMF is induced with the proportionality constant being the inductance. Similar to how capacitors charged up and stored energy, inductors also store energy equal to 1 half Li squared. As the current flows and the inductor resists the current, the energy depletes. It turns out that the current decays exponentially, 
with the new time constant tau for what we call RL circuits equals to L over R. Finally, we get to combine capacitors and inductors to get LC circuits. When they're combined in the same circuit, inductors and capacitors create oscillating current with angular frequency 1 over radical LC. This is because as current increases, the inductor fights harder to oppose the current while the capacitor charges, and then as the capacitor charges, current slows down and the inductor fights this change, essentially creating a feedback loop. Because of this, energy alternates between capacitor and inductor potential energy.